I'm Michael Collins. I give concerts as a clarinetist and conductor. Without Weber, the clarinet wouldn't be where it is today. Musically incredibly satisfying to play. The audiences seem to love them so much. The reason I actually play the clarinet is because as a young lad, I heard a recording of Weber's second clarinet concerto, and it was by the British clarinetist Gervais de Paia with the London Symphony Orchestra and Colin Davis. And I just fell in love with this recording, so much so that on the old LP, I used to play frisbees with it in the garden as well as then putting it back on the record player to listen to it. So I grew up with this recording and it, so it was a very, holds a special place in my heart. I didn't know then what I liked about it. I just loved the whole idea of the fireworks and the clarinet and the clarinet playing high, low, fast, slow. But the thing I've learned over the years, obviously that when I go back to this recording, the thing I like about it is this openness. The wonderful thing about Weber concertos is that if you just play what's on the music, you know, what's, what Weber wrote, and be in, totally honest to yourself and to Weber, these pieces are wonderful and well-crafted works that are adored around the world. And this recording that I have with Gervais de Paia covers those points. I mean, it's very natural. There's no selfishness about it. It's very open and very fresh. Even all these years later, I can put it on and, and hear this real freshness about it. And, and that's what I really love. I still think it's the greatest recording of this piece. Weber is an extremely important composer for the clarinet. Without him, the clarinet wouldn't be where it is today. That's absolutely for sure. He took the instrument to another level, thanks to his friend, the clarinetist Heinrich Behrmann, who performed all the works which Weber composed. Um, Weber really used and explored the clarinet to its full extent. And I suppose we can only tell by, you know, history books and letters and so on, that Heinrich Behrmann was a real virtuoso on the instrument. So Weber used that to really exploit the technical possibilities of the clarinet and the two concertos, which are both different. The one I'm going to play with the old straw orchestra, number two in E flat, is more virtuosic. I suppose I can say it's fun, it's quite light, it's got its serious moments. The second movement, a romance, is very operatic. It has a sort of recitative. So the clarinet is taking on the role of uh, an opera singer. And this is the case throughout uh, with Weber's music. He treats the clarinet firstly as a virtuosic instrument, but secondly as something as close as possible to the human voice. So we're very lucky that we have these pieces which are quite short, they're only about 20 minutes or so, the concertos, but they really demonstrate and use every possibility. The clarinet, which we know today, can do so well. Playing this second concerto by Weber presents all sorts of interesting problems. First of all, the first movement, the very first entry, one really can't imagine something more difficult than this very first entry. So you have this long introduction in the orchestra and the clarinet comes in on a very high note, a concert E flat at the top of the instrument, fortissimo, and then immediately drops three octaves, the same E flat, three octaves lower. So you've got this instant jump of three octaves, first two notes of this concerto. And the big problem there we have is intonation. So if you're a little tense, a little nervous at the start of the piece, this top note can blow rather sharp. And then you're going down to this very low note, which is going to be flat. So relax the position of the mouth so it's not too tight for the first note. And then tighten up for the second note. So the, the low note is going to be sharper, not flat. These are just the first two notes of this concerto that we're dealing with. After that, it, he goes straight off into something quite virtuosic. After that, he, he goes down the path of something more acceptable to play, so we can just relax a little more and enjoy this wonderful music. And then it's like preparing for a, a big race, and it's the, the music revving up again, and off it goes. And the clarinet takes on this wacky virtuosic role again, which leads into yet another tutti. And then we have this middle section, which Weber uses 
the full range of the instrument, low to high. He loves this, low to high, just to show that the this clarinet has an extensive range. So it, again, melodies, melodies, followed by something virtuosic. And that's the theme throughout the fast movements. It's, you know, something virtuosic, technically demanding, followed by something with a beautiful melody. And then it leads into the, the final ridiculous moment for the clarinet, where I always liken it to the Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto, when you have these incredibly fast octaves for the piano. For us, it's tonguing these big arpeggios that we have towards the end of the first movement, big chords in the orchestra, and then we have to play these arpeggios from the top to the bottom of the instrument three times. So there's the first movement. It just doesn't let up for a minute. Now we have the second movement, Pizzicatocelli starting the movement, followed by this very dark, almost funeral-like music that's going on in a minor key for eight bars. And then it's taken over by a tutti in the orchestra, which then moves to the major. So G minor, G major, G minor, G major. It's going throughout the major minor all the time until we reach the middle section, a recitative, a real recitative, which the clarinet is like a virtuosic opera singer. It's telling a story. I can't tell you the story, but it is a story. And I suppose that's what I have in my own mind. I just have my own story. It's different each time, but that helps me, I hope, achieve the story I'm trying to get across to the public. And the, the movement ends just how it started with this um, rather sad melody in G minor. We then come to the last movement, a rondo a la polacca. And it really is a dance kind of movement in three, four. And the hardest thing about this movement is it's very tempting to go fast. But of course, a polonaise is not that fast. A la polacca is not that fast. So we're just slight at, at odds because the music is incredibly virtuosic. So you sort of want to whiz off and um, play it in a very fast but there's a real dotted rhythm throughout, and it doesn't suit this dotted rhythm if it goes too fast. So we're, we're, this is throughout the last movement, and then we, we get to the final coda, which is explosive. The clarinet showing off what it can do, hopefully, very well. Audiences love this moment because it, it, it gives a chance for the soloist to really show off and demonstrate all the technical prowess and, and fun, because it is, at the end of it all, it is actually a very fun movement to play. Recording, you have to be on your best behaviour, and it means dotting the I's, crossing the T's, technically getting through all these the difficult passage works with a cleanliness that the modern day microphone will pick up any little blip so it, it makes recording very, very difficult. And for me, it can also take the fun out of what we're trying to actually do because we're so often concerned with trying to make it work technically 100% that we lose sight of the, the fun and the frolics that we would give the music in a concert scenario. So the two scenarios are very, very different. For me, the concert scenario with this work, I much prefer <laughs> because we, I think one has to walk onto the platform knowing there are going to be little blips. It's that sort of piece um, to try and play it 100% perfectly. Um, you're going to lose some of the character. So what am I trying to say? I suppose I'm trying to say that in a concert, we have to take a risk with this music. And that was the other thing I, I wanted to point out, that it's very easy with this sort of passage work to start running, running away from the orchestra, to start rushing, um, which is dangerous. But in a concert, you can get away with that somehow because that adds to the adrenaline, to the fire of the whole performance. Whereas in a recording, you have to really be on your best behavior. In my personal view, the concert wins hands down. <laughs>